Tonight, I'm going to introduce my dear friend, Pamela Geller. Uh, when I started blogging in 2004, back when uh, there was no YouTube, there was no ads on the internet, 9-11 um, happened, and that's when people started using the internet more uh, the first time, the first major event. Uh, I started about that time, and so did my friend, Pamela Geller. Pamela over the years is one of the strongest voices out there in the public domain today. She is one of the most attacked voices out there in the public domain. Um, I, I, I'm looking through all the stories I've written about Pamela over the years, and a couple popped up today. One was uh, kind of humorous, and that was that uh, these, these Muslim inmates had sued Pamela back in 2015 because she put up a bikini vlog where she was uh, on the beach and uh, live blogging uh, years ago, and they sued her for her polka dot bikini blog. So uh, this is a type of attack she gets, just pure nonsense, from pure nonsense to, uh, to, to more serious matters. Um, in 2016, Pamela put on a Draw Muhammad contest in Texas, and uh, during that contest, some uh, jihadis drove from Arizona over to Texas, and they were going to shoot up the place. And uh, uh, unfortunately, they forgot that they were in Texas. And when they got out of their car, uh, the security uh, shot both these guys dead. And, um, and uh, something else had happened. And this is Pamela. It didn't stop her. It's, it's never stopped her. You know, I know there's some brave voices in this room tonight. Um, Pamela uh, is, is above above all the rest. Um, there was a few years ago, this jihadist ISIS supporter, had, he was in Boston, he was driving down to New York City, and his goal was to go down to New York City and to behead Pamela Geller. These are the type of threats that she gets regularly. Um, she, uh, she, as you know, she travels with security. She's, um, she's just absolutely fearless and um, she, uh, they caught this guy, obviously. Um, Pamela's here today, and we're so grateful that Pamela is, is not only here, but she keeps speaking out. They caught this guy, and Pamela had to even go testify when, when, they, when they arrested him and brought him to court. So um, she had to sit in front of this guy, and the good news is this, uh, this, this uh, maniac got thrown in jail for 28 years. So that's, that's the good news. And... Uh, the good news is they caught him. And uh, so uh, I, despite all of this, Pamela regularly gets attacked by, unfortunately, people on the conservative side. And I just think that's an absolute shame. I know no one in the movement who has more integrity than Pam, Pamela Geller. Not a soul. I know no one who has more courage than Pamela Geller. I, I know no one who is as entertaining and honest as Pamela Geller. And uh, I just think we're just uh, so blessed to have Pamela Geller here with us tonight. So here's Pamela. First, I want to God bless you for being here. Here we are. Here we are, 18 years after 9-11. Let's take a moment to reflect. This past week, the memorials, comm comm commemorations, on Twitter, on Facebook, the hashtag, never forget. And I, I find this absurd. Uh, what is it that we're not supposed to forget? You can't talk about the motive, forget about the motive. You can't talk about the jihadic doctrine, forget about the jihadic doctrine. You can't talk about the fact that in the 9-11 Muslim terrorist last letters, they mentioned Allah 90 times. So in the wake of the ensuing global intellectual terrorism, I think a more apt hashtag would be remember to forget. 9-11 was a great victory for the global jihad movement. Don't kid yourself. Look where we are 20 years later. Look where we are 30 years later after uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini issued a death fatwa 
on Salman Rushdie uh, for a book he wrote. He called on Muslims to slaughter Salman Rushdie. Now, the difference in the response by the West is striking. Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, a diehard conservative, immediately provided round-the-clock protection to a hard-left liberal, Salman Rushdie, who derided her in public, mocked her, called her Margaret Torture, but she said, this is not a partisan fight. This is a civilizational war. Who would have imagined that 30 years later that the, the mullahs won? Since the attack, 9-11, Salman Rushdie, the attack on free speech has been relentless. Think about it. In the 20 years since 9-11, there's not been one, not one Hollywood movie made about it. With the exception of Flight 93, which was more of a documentary, which literally was the, the transmission. It was the, li the, the literal transmission of what was going on in, in the airplane and, and the ground. So think of all the World War I movies, all the World War II movies, Korea, Vietnam, the largest attack on American soil, not Pearl Harbor where they targeted a military installation, no. They targeted women and children, men, mothers, fathers, going to work, going to school, not one movie. And oh, how they salute themselves. They're always giving themselves awards for their bravery in Hollywood. Award after award for the chances they take. Not one. It's astonishing. So let's consider this. Um, it's difficult for me because I got involved after 9-11. Remember, I was a quintessential New York City career girl. I was the publisher of, uh, of a New York City newspaper. I loved my art, my fashion. And then 9-11 just shook me. I assumed my freedom. I, I was apolitical. I thought the good guys won. Evil was defeated, the good cop is on the beat, and then 9-11. Everyone that had a normal, rational, moral response to 9-11 has been demonized, marginalized, and rendered radioactive. We learn the media are cowards. We learn that 9-11 and R Rushdie were not the end, but they were the beginning. In the early years of the, tw uh, 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 who would have suspected in the 90s that the early years of the 20th century, 21st century would be about blasphemy, constantly about blasphemy. What is Islamophobia? It's, a, it's blasphemy. That's what Islamophobia is. You cannot criticize Islam. Who, could you imagine if you walked over to someone in the 90s on the street and said, do you, do you know that in the early 21st century there's gonna be a cartoon crisis? People would have said, what did Mickey Mouse do? It's, it's unfathomable. Salman Rushdie said it was like falling through the looking glass. And I tell you, we all fell. We learned the media are cowards. We learned the art world are cowards. We learned the entertainment business are cowards. A couple of years ago, at an art exhibit called, ironically, Passion for Freedom, a piece of artwork by the artist Mimsy was withdrawn, forced to be withdrawn from the exhibit. Police said that it was inflammatory content and that they couldn't protect it. And if they w would have to, they'd have to pay 50 grand. Here. How often do we see that in America? If you have a conservative speaker on the very rare occasion, we always have to pay extra money. When I was in Garland, I had to pay extra money to the police. No one has ever had to do that. And what's interesting is that because it needs extra security, oh, that, that's your fault, leftist Islamic alliance. We're not safe because you who are imposing this $50,000 or however much on us because you created this unsafe environment. It's like the rackets, if you think about it. And all of us, anyone who's been, we used to be invited all the time to the colleges. Oh, never. So that's why we have this, this lost generation, this intellectually bankrupt generation. The piece, I want to just tell you about the piece of artwork that was withdrawn. It was little toy figures Little toys, mice, hedgehogs, rabbits, they're sitting on a green hilltop and they're sunning themselves and they're listening to the radio and they're playing games and off in the distance are the same little toy figures dressed as ISIS. And this was withdrawn from a freedom exhibit. You can't make this stuff up. And the artist, Mimsy, said she had adopted that pseudonym because as the daughter of a Syrian father who was Jewish, she had to, he had to flee Lebanon from jihadists. 
So ironically, here she is in the West and in the same, if not even graver, danger. Interestingly enough, let's, oh, uh, let me give you a quote that she said. She said, Mimsy, I love my freedom. I'm aware of the very real threat to that freedom from Islamic fascism, and I'm not going to pander to them or justify it like many people on the left are doing. But they did withdraw the artwork. Let's talk about an unknown liberal cartoonist in Seattle, Washington, who was a fan of South Park. And the South Park creators did an episode where they made a joke about not being able to show Muhammad. Well, you know you're not allowed to make a joke about not being able to show Muhammad. So she unknowingly said, well, let's everybody draw Muhammad, thinking, of course, that you can't kill everybody. Well, within 24 hours, she had a fatwa on her head. The FBI said she had to go into um, witness protection at her own expense. She had to leave her job. She had to leave her home. She had to change her name at her own expense. There's no more Molly. She's remained in hiding ever since. Rushdie said to the jihadis, freedom, I'm sorry, the jihadis said to, to Rushdie, freedom, freedom of speech is a non-starter. And Rushdie said, no, sir, it is not. Freedom of speech is the whole thing, the whole ballgame. Freedom of speech is life itself. Amen. Well, in the wake of Rushdie, what we didn't see coming was the concept of blasphemy that it would be manipulated by devout Muslims into this concept of offense of believers. And thus, any, any claims of racism and this invention of the word Islamophobia was the consequence of Rushdie and even 9-11. And this idea of Islamophobia is nothing more than a thought-crushing device designed to silence all criticism of Islam. That's what Islamophobia is. At beginning and end. And let's be honest, they've been, they've been very successful. They've been very successful. Rushdie became the template for this global intellectual terrorism. In 2005, you have this eruption in Denmark over cartoons, and it left hundreds dead, embassies burned. In 2011, in 2015, Charlie Hebdo, a satirical French magazine, was targeted by jihadis. And in 15, as you know, they slaughtered the staff, including the publisher, and 11 more were injured. And just for knowing, that event that I did in Garland, Texas, was in support of Hebdo. That's why I did it. I didn't do it to be provocative. Three days after the Hebdo slaughter, do you know Muslim leaders gathered in Garland, Texas, in support of the Sharia, in support of the ideology behind that mass slaughter? Wouldn't that have been a gorgeous golden opportunity to stand up and say, we support the freedom of speech? That's why I went to Garland. I went to that same place, I went to that same room, and I ran a Muhammad art exhibit. They always call it a, you know, an art contest. Like I, it was an art exhibit. It was showing all of the depictions of Muhammad throughout history when people weren't being killed, you know, like Dante's Inferno. That's why I was in Garland, but we'll get there. I want to talk about the silencing of speech every single day. Drip, 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 drip. In a notorious incident in 2017, students at Middlebury College shouted down a conservative scholar, Charles Murray, and then a group of protesters attacked Murray and a faculty member who suffered a concussion. And last month, the terrified group CARE demanded Eventbrite take down an event I was speaking at, and I rarely speak because people are terrified to invite me, at the New York Young Republicans Club. And they vowed to never allow a Pamela Geller event on Eventbrite. I guess they didn't know about this one, huh, fellas? <laughs> Mind you, Eventbrite continues to host events by monsters. There's an event for the vile anti-Semite and, and jihad supporter Linda Sarsour. There, the vile Ilhan Omar and the unindicted co-conspirators UAE designated terrorist group CARE are all on Eventbrite as we speak. But I am banned. Why? 
because the ideas of the left and the ideas of Islam cannot stand up to challenge and scrutiny. So they have to silence us. I have been banned from speaking everywhere. So first, I want to congratulate and salute Jim Hoff, Gateway Pundit, Eagle Council, for having the bravery to invite me to speak. No dissent, no matter how small, can be tolerated. If we do not stand up to this bullying and censorship, the freedom of speech will be a dead letter in this country, and only totalitarians will be allowed to be heard. For my part, I'm doing everything that I can, but cowardice and capitulation are pandemic today. The United Nations, under yes, Barack Obama, yes, approved a defamation of religions resolution pushed by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation is 56 Muslim countries and the Palestinian Authority, and they vote as one. So if any of you were ever wondering why, why is every resolution against Israel? Why are there no resolutions against the worst human rights abuses in the world? That's why they vote as one. And they pass this resolution, which by the way, only names Islam and Muslims as targets of defamation. Forget about the fact that it, uh, anti-Semitic crime and, and rhetoric is at all time highs worldwide. But you see what it is? It's a transparent effort to squelch exactly the kind of speech and advocacy undertaken by critics. And in a breathtaking omission, the UN document made no mention of the appalling levels of persecution against dissenting Muslims and non-Muslim minorities in the Muslim world, and no mention of the genocide of Christians in Africa and in the Middle East. Wholesale slaughter that no one is talking about. <laughs> Freedom of speech is the foundation of a free society. Without it, a tyrant can wreak havoc unopposed while his opponents are silenced. If speech that offends a group is outlawed, that group has absolute power, and a free society is destroyed. A group that cannot be criticized cannot be opposed. It can work its will no matter what, and no one will be able to say anything to stop it. Putting up with being offended is essential in a pluralistic society in which people differ on basic truths. If a group will not bear being offended uh, without resorting to violence, that group will rule unopposed while everyone else lives in fear. Are we not seeing this? Other groups are curtailing their activities to appease the violent group. This results in the violent group be able, being able to tyrannize the others. Inoffensive speech needs no protection. Ideas that we like need no protection, that's easy. The First Amendment was designed for this specific purpose. It was developed precisely in order to protect, protect speech that was offensive to some, in order to prevent those that had power and claiming they were offended by speech, opposing them and silencing the powerless. The most important civil liberty, the most important civil liberty of all, is the right not to be blown up. Any criticism of jihad terror that examines its ideological roots is called Islam Islamophobia. The word is used to intimidate people into thinking there is something wrong with opposing jihad terror. This deforms our response to terrorism by placing off limits any examination of its guiding ideology and effectively enforces the Sharia blasphemy laws in the United States by placing Islam, Muhammad, and uh, the Quran are completely off limits. It's extraordinary. And everyone is sort of like, I don't know, Helen Keller and someone moved the furniture. It is the biggest story of our day. The last frontier is the internet. It's where I, it's where Jim, it was the last place we could communicate with you. They removed us everywhere. And they saw the power of that in the 2016 election. Platforms that should be neutral and open to all are anything but, and a dissenter from the far left agenda will find it increasingly difficult to take any public stance. I can speak to this 
terrible new reality. First, I'm a human rights activist dedicated to freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and equality for all before the law. My colleagues and I have been scrubbed by Google, Google search. I was always on the front page. I've been doing this since after 9-11. Scrubbed. We don't exist. Disappeared. I've been banned by Google AdSense. No revenue. They wipe me out completely. Shadow banned by Twitter. And I cannot tell you how many times I've been incarcerated in Facebook jail. <laughs> so this is, to me, the main front, because social media is the public square. Think about it. It's how we communicate. Back in the 20th century, you had a telephone. You had a telephone number. Today, you have an IP address. Could you imagine if AT&T listened in on your conversations and said, we're taking away your telephone. We don't like what you said about uh, Mayor de Blasio. That's what's happening. They're monitoring your comments. They're monitoring your, what you post. My, I have millions of followers on Facebook. They don't get my, my, my updates in their newsfeed. It's very sinister, very underhandedly done, you notice? I have been the target of multiple assassination plots. Failed, I might add, happily. Uh, as Jim mentioned, in Garland, Texas, they opened fire on my event. And you know what's really, really disturbing? The FBI knew about the plot. The FBI was communicating with the jihadis. The FBI was texting the jihadis. The FBI was texting them during the attack. The FBI was in a car behind the jihadis. And when they opened fire, he pulled away. He did nothing to stop them. They were so much a part of the plan. Do you know lo local law enforcement pulled them over? They, they thought that they were part, part, part of the Islamic cell. We never got a straight answer. As a matter of fact, Bruce Joyner, the, the, the security uh, uh, guard that was shot, is suing the DOJ. But of course, they're me being met with a, uh, a wall of silence. And as I said, that was a response in support of Hebdo. But if you go online and you watch the interviews with me and Erin Burnett and on ABC and Brian Ross, you would think uh, that I killed Obama's mother. In 2006, I filed suit against the Department of Justice challenging Section 230 of the FEC code, which provides immunity from lawsuits to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, thereby permitting these social media giants to engage in the government-sanctioned censorship and discriminatory business practice free from legal challenge. The suit keeps getting bounced back. It's ongoing. This is, this is going to be an enormous challenge, but I do not believe that the government should take over. Listen, I'm an individual rights advocate. I believe in property rights. I believe in ownership. I don't want to nationalize social media. But, but, the internet was paid for by you and me. It was the American taxpayer dollar that, in, that funded the invention of the internet. They're on it, so they got to behave. And that's where I would come from. Because if you give the government the power over social media, you know you're not going to have a Republican president for the rest of your life. You know that, right? And you know they're going to turn it on you. They just need to ensure our First Amendment rights. No incitement to murder. It's easy. Listen, when I first started Stormfront, was online, and, and they invented names for me like neo -kikis and I mean, I, I, they didn't bother me. They were my, my, a vicious enemy. But you see, I know my ideas are better. I know I will win. I know it. I'm right, and I'm righteous. But if I can't get my ideas out there, if we are silenced and we are systematically silenced, it's over. Whatever you guys are planning, whatever big strategies you have, it's, it's done. This is life itself. This is the most important issue. We must stand with courage against such assaults or we will lose our society. America's intellectual leadership has collapsed, betraying the very premise that made their existence possible, denying the intellect. Academic elites, intellectuals spend their time denying the intellect. They deny reality. So what is needed? You, the new intellectual, thought leaders. America's founders were new intellectuals. They radically transformed traditional ideas about, about the individual, about individual liberty, about society, and the role of government. 
Their new nation offered proof to the world that it was possible to create, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, something new under the sun. It's why I fight. I have filed over a dozen lawsuits in over a dozen cities every time they denied me the right to run an ad. And was I just running an ad to be provocative? No, I was responding to a vicious anti-war uh, or anti-Israel or anti-America ad. I would always respond. I'd see an anti-Israel ad. I ran an ad that said, in any war between the civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man. Support Israel, defeat jihad. You would have thought I beheaded a three-year-old in the street. New York banned my ad, denied my ad. It went like a domino across the country. It was incredible. Another interesting CNN, Erin Burnett, Pamela Gell moment that I think you'll find most enjoyable. I sued. I sued and I won. I sued and I won. Well, yeah. In San Francisco, literally the gay mecca of this country, they were running jihad ads. So I ran my uh, jihad ads highlighting uh, Muslim oppression of gays in Islamic countries. And their human rights count, their city council, which is headed up by a transgender, Teresa Sparks, issued the first resolution of its kind against me. You can't make this stuff up. I won in every city, New York, uh, Washington was still suing. Um, Seattle, San Francisco, Denver. So what did they do? They banned all political and, and issue-related ads. The Gela ban. It's extraordinary. And you know what? Nobody knows about this. It's incredible. All stealth. All stealth. Done by stealth. If Trump is reelected in 2020, and can accomplish more of his agenda, the entire political culture can be transformed by 2024. Yeah. Otherwise, if Democrats win in 2024, they'll continue their efforts to make the US into an authoritarian socialist state. You can bet on it. Our children have been inculcated in this poison. I mean, how else could a numbskull like Alexandria, Ortez, Cortez, oh, Acaxia, 40 names, okay, <laughs> be so exalted and so loved? It's the entire culture. Consider this. There was well over 100 new congressmen elected in 2018, and all they talk about is AOC, Ilan Omar, who married her. Brother, I mean, we had to create a name. She, it's her husband. <laughs> how are Americans not repulsed? How is this? How are they not vomiting? And yet, you know, they sanctioned. This is what we. This is the one lesson. The one lesson we can take away from the left. No matter how egregious a crime, Il 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 the Brusband, Ilan Omar, uh, Tlaib, uh, I'm not even going to repeat what she said with her you know, four-letter words, or Governor Blackface over here in Virginia. No matter how egregious the crime or the deed, they circle the wagons. On the right, on the right, as soon as someone's in the crosshairs, the only thing circular is a firing squad. This is why we're failing. And this is why Trump was elected. He was the first guy that didn't say, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was the first guy, he finally had a street fighter in a street fight. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, we were always, you know, those of us on the right, our eyes, I like to call us the rational. When they pick people we didn't like, and let me tell you, they pick some winners. I don't want to get into it, but McCain, seriously? We had two Democrats running. And then a lovely man, but a weak sister, Mitt Romney. We weak, weak sister. We went along, we got out there, yeah, McCain. And now we got to pick. And they won't go along? I mean, it is incredible how what Trump has done is exposed all these people. He unmasked the Democratic Party. Yeah. 
Yeah. We must be better. We must be better. No war has ever been won on the defense, ever. And I salute the warriors in this room. I see Bev Pearlson, leader of the Band of Mothers, who was indefatigable for years in getting to secure the release of the Leavenworth 10. God bless you, Bev. I see Katie O'Malley, an unsung hero, connector of us all, and you. No one's going to save you. You are going to save you. Reason and morality are the only weapons that determine the course of history. Amen. And intellectual movements were all started by a small group. Right. All. The Democrats, the status, they have no reason. They have no morality. They drop them because they have no right to carry them. But you have. Pick them up and get to work. History is calling you now, not tomorrow, not next week. The free world hangs in the balance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They're throwing me one question. Who will be brave? Go. On August 17th, we joined with the Proud Boys in Portland. Uh, his name is Enrique Terrio. To have a march called End Domestic Terrorism in Portland. And so a group of us got together and we organized to have a march because that at the last march we had, a conservative reporter was almost murdered. They hit him in the head. Andy, yeah. And um, so there's never been an arrest. So when we gathered our groups together, and a lot of people were afraid to march because they said Antifa would be out you know, in mass. This was my second march to end domestic terrorism in Portland. And so the mayor didn't call city police there. We didn't see the governor have police there. But during our march, black SUVs drove up and on trailers behind them were federal marshals. Thank God for Donald Trump. Thank God. Because there was not one incident where anybody got hurt, but I texted the president, tweeted him, and thanked him. Good for you. Two hours later, he said, I'm going to have Antifa designated okay. as domestic it is, terrorists. Yeah. We have to stand up, and we're having a march every month. And a, we a do couple it things. Eugene. It's a Thank point. you. Thank you. Antifa is designated a terrorist group, by the way, in Germany. And they ought to know. That's the first thing. The second thing is, to this uh, lovely woman's point, make no mistake, this is a war. When a country, refu when a faction in a country refuses to accept the results of a free and fair election, they did it with Bush, and I don't think the right even understood then, when they refuse to accept, the, it is a civil war. And I think that's exactly what's happening now. They won't like it, but I'm telling you, you lock and load. Because they're coming after you. They're coming after you. They're not kidding. They're, they're inciting to violence. They know that they've been getting away with this for the past 10 years now. And if you think it stands still, nothing stands still. Everything is fluid. And they mean war. And if he, and I'm not going to say he, it, when President Trump gets reelected, you better hunker down, ladies and gentlemen. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs>